Okay, I think, I think I'll go ahead and get started. We still have some folks joining. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Petrus, and I'm a CRA coordinator with NCRC. I'm really excited about the webinar today. We had over a thousand people register, and it's, it's fantastic to have that many people because the the heart and soul of CRA really is public participation. So your timing is also perfect because we expect a rulemaking to launch soon from the federal banking regulators that will update CRA regulations. So uh, just another note to please put your name or organization and location if you're comfortable doing so into the chat. And we have a quick poll question that I'll come back to in a few minutes. Before I get started, a little bit about NCRC and just a note that we will be sharing the slides after the presentation today. So don't worry about reading every word or catching everything that I review. Um, a little background on NCRC. We are an organization that was founded in 1990. We're an association of over 630 community-based members that all promote fairness in banking, housing, and business development. The CRA is, is one of the hearts of our work. We um, share a common purpose with the CRA, which is a just economy for all Americans. And there is a, a link on this slide to membership. So hopefully you will check that out after the webinar today if you're not already a member. The goal of the webinar today is to give you all a foundational knowledge of CRA. I'll go over a brief history of CRA, discuss how our federal regulators enforce the statute, um, and I'll talk about how you can get involved and what NCRC does to help. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, there are a lot of participants on the call today, so we're asked, I'm gonna ask you to use the Q&A tool for questions, and I'll save about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer questions. I did put my email and contact information in the chat, so if I don't address a question you have today, I do invite you to email me after the webinar, and I'll get back to you. And again, uh, for those who have just joined us, um, if you're comfortable putting your name and organization, do so into the chat. And I also encourage you all to get to know each other and pass notes during the webinar to each other. So moving on to a brief history of CRA. Oops, go back. So when thinking about the CRA, it's always helpful, I think, to check in on why banks exist in the first place. Banks are entities that are chartered by state and federal governments to serve a public purpose. You may have heard the phrase safety and soundness. And what that refers to is that the safety and soundness of our banking system and our banks are really important to the country's stability and economic development. So while banks are private entities and most, most of them are owned by shareholders and we all want them to be financially sustainable, it's also important to remember that they serve a public purpose. And that's why your involvement, the public's involvement in, CR, in CRA is, is really important in ensuring that there's a proper balancing of the bank's needs with the needs of the community. So on that note, I wanna take a quick look, look at the poll results. And it looks like 97 of you have participated in an election over half, which is great. 65% have sent letters to Congress people or senators, but 88% of you have not uh, gotten involved in CRA enforcement. So our hope is that after today, you will be inspired to learn more about the CRA and you'll have a set of tools that you can use to, to get involved in enforcing CRA. And also that means engaging with the regulators and banks in your community. 
Again, going back to the public purpose of banks, banks are an important anchor in communities. An underlying principle behind CRA is that without economic justice, you can't have justice. And you can't have economic justice without access to affordable and safe capital. Homeownership is how people build wealth and capital is how people uh, are empowered to start businesses. So banks again have a really important purpose in our society and an obligation to meet the capital needs of all communities. When reading CRA regulations or thinking about what the CRA requires banks to do, it's also interesting. Um, it, it tells an interesting story about history. So CRA, what CRA tells us is that banks really weren't fulfilling their obligations to all communities. Um, this is a picture of a redlining map that which probably a lot of you have heard of. Redlining was a, a decades long practice by both the public and private sector to refuse to make loans in minority communities. This is a map of Phoenix um, from the 1930s. And these, these redlining maps were created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. That was an agency that um, was formed after the Great Depression. They did a lot of good work in the mortgage market, but they also created the practice of redlining. They would uh, send employees to cities around the country, and those employees would draw maps like this one, where they would color code certain neighborhoods based on factors like class, race, and immigrant status. And the red areas were, I don't know if you can see the slide, but at the bottom, uh, the red area is called hazardous. And in those communities, those neighborhoods, if you live there, you could not get a mortgage. So this resulted in decades of disinvestment in certain communities. In the 60s and 70s, Congress decided to do something about this to end redlining and discrimination in housing and enacted several laws. The first of these was the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which prohibits discrimination. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act in 1974 was another statute prohibiting discrimination in lending then in 1975, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, also known as HUMDA, uh, was enacted to require lenders to collect and disclose data about the ethnicity and race of borrowers and credit applicants. And then in 1977, the CRA was enacted. Um, it's the only one of these laws that actually creates an affirmative obligation on banks to take action. It requires banks to serve the entire communities in the markets where they're located, including low and moderate income communities. Since it was passed in 1977, there have been a couple of updates, not many, but um, there was an update in 1989 requiring banks bank supervisors to publicly disclose CRA ratings and performance evaluations. In 1995, there was regulatory reform that largely created CRA exams as we know them today. And I'll talk more about those in a few minutes. But since 95, there have, haven't been any updates and um, that will hopefully change soon. We do expect the FDIC Federal Reserve and the OCC to issue a joint notice of proposed rulemaking, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on in the presentation. Again, the CRA, um, this, this language comes straight from the statute. It requires banks to meet the credit needs of the entire community in which they are located, consistent with safe and sound banking operations. So basically, when, bank, when a bank takes deposits, it really should be reinvesting those deposits into the community. 
and that reinvestment of deposits is part of part of their public purpose, part of the obligation they have when they're given the privilege of a bank charter. The CRA has resulted in a lot of reinvestment. So it is, it is making a difference. Since 1996, it's resulted in over $880 billion in loans for affordable housing and economic development and over 970 billion in small business loans. There also have been a lot of studies that have found that CRA covered lending is not only safe and sound, but it's in a lot of cases actually safer and sounder, meaning less risky than non-CRA covered lending. Um, just a, a footnote here, there, there have been a lot of criticisms about CRA leading to or causing the 2008 housing crisis and that uh, those criticisms have largely been discredited with research that that shows that actually CRA covered mortgage lending is is not what led to the crisis it was mostly um, non-CRA covered lenders that engaged in the riskiest mortgage practices So moving on to the next section of the webinar, how is CRA implemented? Um, I'll talk about enforcement and some enforcement issues. CRA's basic tool for enforcement is the performance evaluation. Every three or four years, the bank's primary federal regulator will do conduct a CRA exam. And the outcome of that exam is a document, a PDF called the performance evaluation. All of the performance evaluations are available online for the public to download. Unfortunately, sometimes they're not uh, available immediately, but eventually they are, they are published on the regulator's website. The CRA exam process is an opportunity for you to get involved. Um, I'll talk more about public comments later, but, but one, Great opportunity is the CRA exam process and public comments received during that process are, are considered in the, the final performance evaluation. So basically, CRA performance evaluations look at how well banks are doing in lending to low and moderate income borrowers and in low and moderate income neighborhoods. The examiners will also look at the level of support for community development projects. And another factor is whether the bank has branches in low and moderate income neighborhoods that are within the bank's um, geographic service areas. So the three regulators that are responsible for CRA enforcement are the FDIC, which regulates state chartered banks for the most part, um, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Fed regulates bank holding companies, and then the OCC, which regulates national banks. If you're interested in a bank and how it's doing in your community, the first step is to figure out who the bank's regulator is, and then look up their performance evaluation. So uh, this tool, the FDIC Institution Directory, is an excellent tool to do that. And that's uh, where I always start when researching a bank. So I'll walk you through what this looks like really quickly using US Bank as an example. So once you get to the directory, type in the bank name. It, it often helps if you put in the city and state of the bank's headquarters. Otherwise, you might, if the bank has a common name, you might pull up dozens of, of results. For US Bank, you only pull up one result, and there will be a link to the left of the bank name. And that link takes you to the directory page, which has a lot of great information about the bank's branch locations, financials. Um, but what we're looking for is who the regulator is. So the primary federal regulator for US Bank, you can see is the OCC. 
And at the bottom right is a link to the OCC's CRA ratings page. And the bottom right is where you'll always see the CRA ratings link for each um, bank you look up. Once you get to the regulator site, you have to enter the bank's name again and um, you'll pull up the, the bank's rating. So here you can see that US Bank has an outstanding rating from its most recent performance evaluation. And this is where you can also click on the date. I think the date is where the hyperlink is that will pull up the actual performance evaluation. CRA ratings. So there are four ratings um, that banks can get on CRA exams. It's basically a pass-fail test. A bank either gets outstanding or satisfactory, and that's considered a passing grade, or a needs to improve or substantial non-compliance, which is considered a failing grade. When a bank fails a CRA exam, there are consequences. It is more difficult to merge. It's harder to acquire new branches and the bank is subject to more frequent CRA exams than the usual schedule, which is typically every three to five years. NCRC has called for a more nuanced rating system. We think that um, there should be more than four grades to, to look at how banks are doing relative to each other. And we'll have to wait and see if that's part of the proposed rule that we expect soon. So onto the performance evaluation process, a little more detail into what that looks like. The evaluation involves three tests, referred to as component tests. Um, the first test is the lending test, and that is more heavily weighted than the other two tests, and it counts for 50% of the final grade. There's an investment test that counts for 25% and a services test that counts for another 25%. The CRA exam will apply each of these three tests into the bank's geographic assessment areas. So for example, US Bank has 40 assessment areas and assessment areas are basically where a bank has branches. Um, it's also, it could include areas where the bank has deposit taking ATMs, the bank's main office, and it will include surrounding geographies where the bank has originated or purchased a more majority of its loans. So the, um, the assessment area has to be a metropolitan statistical area, metropolitan division, or one or more contiguous um, political subdivisions. So it's often a county or a grouping of counties. It could be an entire state. Um, and assessment areas cannot arbitrarily exclude low and moderate income neighborhoods. So the way assessment areas are determined is uh, um, between the bank and the CRA examiners, the bank will propose their assessment areas and then the CRA examiners will look at their branch network and and decide if it's being fair, um, and then they'll conduct the exam. So I'll go into more detail on each of the three component tests, the lending test, investment test, and services test. The lending test looks at how the bank is serving the credit needs of its communities in four main areas. It looks at mortgage lending, small business lending, which means businesses under a million dollars in revenue, annual revenue, small and small farm lending. And CRA exam will also look at community development lending with bonus points for flexible or complex lending structures. Community development lending is, is actually required of all banks over a certain asset size. I think it's, it's 1.4 billion in assets. And some of examples of community development lending are affordable housing loans, loans to CDFIs, community development financial institutions, or another example is a loan to commercial properties that can demonstrate job creation in low-income census tracts. 
And when looking at lending, the examiners will also look at income levels of both the assessment area and the borrowers receiving these loans. So the investment test looks at the amount of investment the bank has made that investments that have a community development purpose. Examples are low income housing tax credit investments, new market tax credits, um, investments in CDFIs. Also grants are included in this, in this test. So banks will get CRA credit for grants. Even though grants are not required, we, from what we've seen, most banks do make grants um, and they do get CRA credit if those grants have a community development purpose. And here, like the lending test, banks get bonus points for complexity, innovation, um, and the examiners will look at responsiveness to the community development needs of the communities and neighborhoods being served. So they, they will actually reach out to and interview community groups to find out from the community groups what, what those groups identify as the needs of their own community. And then they'll um, look at the bank's lending and investment to see if that there's a match between the needs and the loans and investments. So the services test, it largely has to do with the branch network and whether the bank has branches in low income, low and moderate income census tracts within the bank's assessment area. Um, you've probably all seen banking deserts and what you notice in those areas are a lot of check cashers, payday lenders, markets that have high cost ATMs, um, basically financial services providers that are for the most part charging abusive rates or extractive fees for services that are more affordable from a bank. So geography and, and bank branches are, are really, really important um, to ensuring access to affordable and safe capital and financial services. Another piece of the services test, which is smaller, um, but also important is community development services. This, this test is weighted less than the, the other parts of the exam, but just to give you an example of what this means, um, these are services that can be anything related to um, providing a financial service or using the financial expertise of a banker. Um, examples are low cost checking accounts for individuals with low incomes, financial literacy programs. You'll often see in CRA exams, a reference to volunteer hours of service of bank employees on nonprofit boards. So all of these tests applied in all the different assessment areas are combined to create this report card. Um, and this is the type of CRA rating summary you'll see in, in every CRA exam. And again, going back to US Bank, you'll see they got outstanding in all categories. Um, there will also be an appendix in each CRA exam where all the assessment areas will be listed. And then you can look at, um, for your state or assessment area, how the bank did in each of the three component tests. This is a a really good place to start. I like to look at these tables to see if there's any area where the bank got a low satisfactory because that, that can tell you for that community, there might be an opportunity to engage with the bank and influence um, where they're locating a branch or what kind of lending they're doing. So just to pause here, I've use this phrase a lot, LMI or low to moderate income. And the reason for that is that the CRA enforcement is colorblind, except for one section of the exam. Um, CRA evaluation focuses on, on income. The one section where um, that is not colorblind is the fair lending and illegal credit practices review section. But typically this is a two to three sentence piece of a several hundred page performance evaluation. So it's not a very rigorous review. Um, so just wanted to take a minute to define 
what LMI means. Um, CRA re regulations define low and moderate according to criteria defined by the US Census Bureau. So low income means uh, individual with income under 50% of the area median income or a median family income that is less than 50%. Um, moderate income includes individuals with income under 80% of the area median. And the area median income is the median or the midpoint family income for a metropolitan statistical area. Um, for a for an urban area or a statewide uh, median family income for people outside MSAs. So how well are the regulators doing and has the CRA put an end to redlining and discrimination? Um, we can definitely say the CRA has helped, but there are a lot of uh, studies and data to show that there still is a lot more work to do. This slide um, is very small text, but hopefully you can read it. Um, this data is from 2014, but it's basically the same as today. 98% of banks get a passing grade on their CRA exam and you know, if I, I was in a class and I knew that 98% would get a pass, I don't think I'd work that hard. So um, we definitely think there needs to be some more rigor in CRA exams. And given um, the state of lending and income inequality, we think there, the, the uh, pass rate doesn't really reflect what's going on in society. So that, that's where you come in. Um, how can you get involved with improving the CRA? This is a picture of Gail Sincata, who was an activist and has been called the mother of CRA. She was an activist in Chicago and she really led the fight for the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and the CRA in the 1970s. Um, she was one of the founders of the National People's Action Organization, which, which led the uh, push for Humda and for CRA. And she really um, summarized it well with this quote that full responsibility for CRA enforcement has always been the job of the people in the neighborhoods. So why should you get involved? Um, your participation in CRA can help banks perform better. It can increase investment into community development. It can increase investment into underserved neighborhoods. And it helps build partnerships with financial institutions that, that just um, creates a feedback loop into the other three benefits to your participation. So CRA is, CRA exams are very data driven. Um, I'll walk through a little bit of the methodology on how banks are evaluated, but wanna just note here that NCRC does a lot of data analysis for its members. And this is sort of like doing your taxes. This data is publicly available. I'll have a slide later with links to where you can find Humda data and small business data. But it's also sometimes nice to get help doing your taxes, even though you can do it yourself. So NCRC does a lot of um, data analysis and research for its members. and provides a lot of uh, other support, but um, you're, you're not alone in this if you're interested in getting help. We can certainly help with that. 
So basically, CRA data methodology looks, evaluates banks by comparing their lending activity to, um, to peers in a market. So this is an example of Humda data that was for an anonymous bank in a certain assessment area. Um, so you'll see orig home originations, you'll see uh, a row for all lenders. And if you look at the category for minority lenders, 30% of originations in this assessment area went to minorities. And for this particular bank, you'll see only 13% of their loans went to minorities. So this is a, a sign that maybe there's something going on with the bank that they need to improve. It's an opportunity, um, we think, for engagement and partnership. Usually that's, that's the best first step. Banks, you know, often really benefit from partnership with community groups, um, such as housing counseling groups, to help them reach underserved markets. So they, they often really value partnering with local organizations and that's, that's really where you all come in. So the methodology for small business data is similar. Um, you'll see the categories of mortgage lending data because of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act do include race and ethnicity. Small business data um, only looks at uh, low LMI tracked data or loans to businesses with under a million dollars in revenue. This, this will change soon because of the Dodd-Frank Section 1071 provision that, that does require lenders to collect demographic data on their small business borrowers. And we're waiting on a rule to be finalized. So in maybe a couple of years, we'll have more demographic data. For now, this is, um, this is what we have to work with, but it's the way that um, CRA methodology looks at small business data is very similar to mortgage lending. It compares how the lender is doing relative to peers in a certain market. This lender you can see for this example in Springfield um, is 43% behind its peers in lending to businesses with under a million in gross annual revenue. So um, again, that signifies probably an issue that needs to be addressed and a good opportunity to partner with the bank. So Humda data is available online from the CFPB and the small business lending data that's used in CRA evaluations. is also available online from the Federal Financial Institutions Exam Council. And again, um, NTRC does help with um, pulling it and analyzing this data, even though it's available and something you can do yourself. We do a lot of this for our members. So how to get involved with CRA. Um, one, one key way to get involved is public comment letters. There are four opportunities for public comment. One is during CRA performance evaluations, which I discussed earlier. Um, the regulators publish their exam schedule. And so when the exam is going on, you can um, submit comments and that will become part of the bank's CRA file. Comments are also um, important in mergers and branch acquisitions. So when a bank applies to merge, there is a 30 day comment period following that application date during which the public can send in comments and that becomes part of the merger review. There is a public comment process when banks announce branch closures, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And then uh, again, in the upcoming CRA reform 
rulemaking process. Um, we hope that some of you will consider commenting and being a part of that process. So what can the, what does a comment letter look like? Comment letters often include data analysis, information relevant to CRA performance in your community, and also uh, information about your organization and how you can partner with banks to improve CRA performance. So commenting on CRA exams, um, the focus is whether the bank is meeting the credit needs of its entire community. Um, again, each regulator publishes their exam schedule and comments will be considered in the performance evaluation if they're received prior to the close of the exam. Um, exams and mergers, uh, think of it as sort of as open election season where it's, it's really a great opportunity where banks are more engaged and likely to get involved with community groups, partner with groups to, to do a better job at um, serving communities. And it's, it's a time when banks engage and make more commitments. So again, on, um, during mergers, banks have to apply to merge or acquire branches. And that's a time when public comments are considered. Um, mergers are, are, the regulators are required to make sure that a merger um, meets the convenience and needs of the communities to be served. So regulators will look at the previous record of the financial institution, the CRA, previous CRA exams. Um, they'll also look at how the expanding bank will serve communities going forward. So this, again, is a great opportunity to engage with the bank. And one thing NCRC does um, is negotiate public benefits agreements with banks during the merger process um, to ensure that they really are going to, that the merger really will serve the convenience and needs of the communities um, and, and really increase CRA reinvestment. One thing to note, I mentioned briefly earlier, is that the comment period for mergers is pretty quick. There's, uh, this is the uh, comment history page for um, US Bank's ongoing merger with Union Bank. So US Bank announced a merger with Union Bank last fall. They applied, uh, submitted a merger application on October 7th, and the comment period deadline was November 6th. So. Um, it's a pretty short time period to get comments in. And again, NCRC definitely is here to help if, uh, if that's something you're interested in exploring. So the public can also comment on branch closures. There, there's one caveat, which is, um, although comments can delay closure, or perhaps uh, result in a public benefits agreement, um, regulators can't prevent a bank from closing a branch. So it's actually very rare that uh, public comment on a branch closure results in the branch staying open. Um, but it is an opportunity to engage. It's an opportunity to um, possibly get a public benefits agreement or often banks will donate buildings and equipment for CRA purposes. So unlike the CRA, a lot has changed since 1995. In this slide, um, I like this picture from Times Square in 1995 because everyone's looking up, no one's looking at a cell phone, no one's, no one's doing online banking on their cell phone. This is a, a 1990s phone and again, I pretty sure no one's doing mobile banking on this device. So hopefully um, you all will sign up to receive updates about the upcoming rulemaking, which is a really once in a lifetime opportunity to get involved in enforcing CRA and making it stronger. 
We have a website, which I've put the link to here, where you can sign up for updates. Um, as soon as the rule is announced, we'll do an analysis. NCRC will um, publish its analysis. We'll have sample comment letters and hope, hope to have your participation in that process. So a little bit more about what NCRC does to help encourage participation in CRA. Um, again, we do data analysis. It's something that can be a bit daunting. So we, we do that for our members frequently. Um, we also have several tools on our website that you can just um, log into the website and use to look up. For example, uh, we have a fair lending tool you can look up. Um, who the market leaders are in mortgage lending to minorities in your city. We provide sample comment letters. Uh, we work on community benefits agreements with banks. Um, typically that, that is in connection with a merger process. And we connect groups to a nationwide coalition. We have over 637 members and um, hope to continue to grow and, and work together to strengthen CRA. So that's, that's it for my presentation. I will take a few questions now. So a question about assessment areas. How is the geographic area for the bank described? Um, you'll um, be able to see the assessment areas described in each performance evaluation. It's typically a, a group of counties, um, or it could be an entire state. Sometimes it's a, a city, um, but typically the vast majority of assessment areas are a cluster of counties. Another question is, are credit unions subject to CRA? They are not. Uh, CRA applies to financial institutions that are federally insured. And so, um, well, <laughs> by the FDIC. So credit unions are federal, federally insured, but no, they're not. They're not subject to CRA. Um, another question, how big does a financial institution have to be to be subject to CRA? So the, the size, uh, if you're federally insured by FDIC, a savings bank or trust, you are subject to CRA. Exams are different for smaller banks. There are, there's sort of three tiers. Um, the exam process I described is for larger banks, but there are, um, there's a small bank process and an intermediate small bank process that is a little bit of an abbreviated process, um, but most banks are big enough, the threshold isn't, isn't very large. So most banks get the full exam process that I just described. So one question, um, is there any inclusion of neo banks, also known as online banks or internet only banks? So that's a great question. There are, um, the assessment area scheme doesn't really um, fit today's world where we have, sometimes you have a digital bank with a, a national charter, so they're subject to CRA. Um, but they have one office in Utah, for example. So their assessment area is a, a cluster of counties in Utah, even though they're doing um, lending nationwide. So this is definitely an area we hope to see reformed in the, the upcoming proposed regulations. Um, we also, I, I think someone asked about fintechs. 
fintechs, you know, some fintechs have a bank charter, but if they don't have a bank charter, they are not subject to CRA. There are also um, non-bank lenders that, that don't get um, CRA exams. So, you know, this, these are all things that have really significantly changed since 1995 that, that we hope will be addressed in the upcoming CRA reform. So uh, Jex asked, is there a language component to the performance evaluation? For example, offering lending support and services for non-English speaking communities. That is something that would definitely qualify for CRA credit under the services test. Um, and there, there is a lot of qualitative language in CRA exams. So there's a, there's a discussion section for each test within each assessment area. Um, the CRA exam for US Bank, for example, I think is more than 900 pages. Uh, and a lot of that is, is a narrative discussion outlining the bank's um, activities. So they'll, they'll give examples of loans. They're, they also, sometimes the CRA examiners will mention financial services such as bank on accounts in the services test. And I think um, they would, the bank would get credit for, for uh, language accessibility in their branches. So another question is, does an ATM count as much as a branch? Does the size of the branch count? The, what, what really counts is the deposit market share. Um, so th there, this is something I may have to come back to in, uh, if, if you'll email me, I can send you some more information on how assessment areas are determined. Um, the CRA examiners will look at um, where the bank's deposits are coming from. And then someone asked, how do you get to the rating summary for each bank? So to do that, you have to go to the each regulator's website. So go to start with the FDIC institution directory, figure out who the regulator is, and then get to the CRA rating page for that regulator. Um, it's a little bit convoluted, but then you'll have to enter the bank's name again, pull up that bank's CRA ratings. Uh, once you see the actual rating, um, you can click on, usually there's a link to the performance evaluation. And then within that performance evaluation, which again could be like dozens of pages or a few hundred pages, the beginning will have that report card rating summary. So, and someone asked, can CRA funds be used to pay for the services of HUD certified housing counseling services? Um, there are, there is a CRA credit for philanthropy and, and I believe grants to HUD certified housing counselors would qualify for CRA credit. I'm not, I, I think that's what the question is. If, if banks fund these types of agencies with grants, yes, that would, that would count as CRA credit. So someone asked if um, I can provide examples of how CRA exams have been used at a local level to identify gaps or exclusionary practices and what the outcomes of those efforts are. So yes, they're um, CRA exams, but also just um, external parties like NCRC or fair housing groups do, doing data analysis, looking at HMDA data. Um, when big gaps are identified, there are different 
different uh, approaches that different groups take, but one approach would be to, to contact the bank, maybe send a letter to the regulator um, to make to, to highlight the gap as part of the CRA exam. Um, the outcome of some of those efforts, I, you know, for, for example, um, I think there was a situation where NCRC noted some real gaps in, in lending in a certain market and sent a letter to the regulator and learned later that um, the bank hired a, a loan officer um, to focus on improving lending in that region. So, so it can really make a difference. And again, I think our emphasis or our, our first um, priority would be partnering with the bank and the regulator um, to see how NCRC members and communities can partner with banks to improve their performance. So one, one person asked, how do examiners select which community organizations to speak to during CRA performance evaluations? I have the same question. Uh, we don't really uh, know exactly how that process works. Um, there are some NCRC members that have been part of, part of those conversations and they're usually um, larger nonprofits that are in communities, but um, we, we really don't know. How, how the regulators go about that process. I would say, you know, you can always volunteer to be one of those groups. Um, if you want to go onto a regulator's website, pull up their CRA exam schedule. And if you see a bank that's in, if you see a branch in your community, you know, you're probably in that bank's assessment area, send the regulator a letter and volunteer. I, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. Um, somebody asked, is it safe to say it's too late to provide comment on a merger when you hear it in the news? So actually, um, typically the first time we hear about a merger is in a press release. So that actually might be a, a, the perfect time to get involved and, and think about commenting on the merger. So the typical process starts with the bank issuing a press release. They'll do an investor call, um, which will talk a lot about the merger. And usually their um, application is submitted after the press release, um, but shortly after, after that. So when you hear about it in the news, that's a great time to get involved. Um, once the application goes in, again, it's a 30 day, there's a 30 day comment period deadline, which is pretty quick. Um, I, I see a lot of questions about what changes are up for discussion in the rulemaking change. And I would like to refer you back to this um, to this part of our website and encourage you to sign up um, to receive updates. We, we don't really know uh, what to expect. We have a lot of hopes for what we see in the rulemaking change, um, but we do expect we're going to um, have a detailed analysis and, and a lot of uh, comments to to the regulators to make, it, it's gonna be really important to have a lot of public input to make sure the, the CRA will be strong. Um, we also have some, we, we have a lot of um, papers on our website about what, you know, what our priorities are in terms of strengthening CRA. So I encourage you all to check out our website and um, let me go back to this. Yes, join NCRC as well. Um, you don't need to be a member to get the updates on the rulemaking process, but we would uh, love to have you join and, and that would give you access to a lot more of our data analysis. Well, I, we 
We have three minutes left on a lot of questions. So again, please email questions. If I haven't addressed them, I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, there's some questions about community benefit agreements. We have a lot of, um, uh, we have a, a summary of how they work on our website and summaries of various community benefits agreements that we've entered into in the past. We are working on, on one with US Bank and Union Bank, for example. Um, we're working on several community benefits agreements, but you can read, read about those on our website. trying to find a question that I can answer in two minutes. One speaker asked how often evaluations are done. Um, this, the regulation or the CRA um, regulations require exams every three to five years in practice that they can be farther apart. Um, that's one thing we think the regulators need to do a better job of. Um, sometimes they can be more than five years apart. Um, and again, they, they, you know, if an exam wraps up, like I, I just pulled a performance evaluation that it took the regulators two years to put it up on their uh, well, a year and a half to, to put it on their website. So um, who watches the regulators? That's you. I think it's just the public. So if, if you see an exam period that's um, too long, uh, a bank that's not been examined in more than five years, I, I think it's a good opportunity to engage with the regulator and just send them a note asking when the next exam will be for that bank. Um, I think that's going to be it today. Again, um, send me an email with questions and thank you so much for joining today.